On today's episode, Linda Blair and David Hasselhoff have to escape from a haunted hotel where an evil witch wants Blair's unborn baby for reasons? It's kind of unclear, actually. We watched Witchery today on Nothing Spookies. <laughs> Welcome back, however you wish to self identify fly on a broomstick oh God. to Nothing Spookies, where we ask the question, the fright is this? No, we don't. We ask the question, the fright is this? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a spookier question. It is. It pre- really is. Do you pre-plan these? No. Never. Really? <laughs> that is off the cuff. Mm-hmm. Oh my I, God, I it's like the least prepared thing I've ever done. I don't know if that's impressive <laughs> or terrifying. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's never impressive to me. <laughs> And, uh, uh, bullshit, you don't plan these out. Sometimes you're just so giddy to, like... Oh, no, like, well, no, you can out. tell the ones that I plan out ahead of time, because those are the ones that fall flat on their face the second I start doing them. <laughs> so, yeah, those ones are easy to, uh, determine. But it's the podcast where we go through an actor's filmography, and she's the most anonymous and culturally untalked about movies that they've made, and decide whether or not they've got a certain something, or just a whole lot of nothing. I'm Cass Lascard. I'm Jameson Rafter. And if it's nothing spookies, that means it must be time for two months of Halloween! colon an ode to scream queens we didn't yeah. really come up with a subtitle for this but that's the yeah. gist of what it is pretty much yeah we're, we're doing a series on uh, on like final girl scream queens the ladies of the horror. ladies of horror yeah. yeah and today we will be uh let's say briefly discussing the career of uh, linda blair best known for playing the possessed little girl in the 1973 classic the exorcist we will of course uh, be talking about her her not terribly uh, uh, illustrious or and or successful career <laughs> following following that early success Shots fired. Uh, one of w- <laughs> one of which is uh, today's film a film that goes by many names mm-hmm. according to uh, tubi tv mm-hmm. it is known as Witchery, mm-hmm. according to the opening titles of the movie on Tubi TV, <laughs> oh, yeah. it is known as Witchcraft Evil Encounters. Yeah, in, in, in parentheses. In parentheses. In parentheses. Yeah. <laughs> so they just say, you know that's the actual title, and then they throw the parentheses in there. Not a colon. No. <laughs> <laughs> Full parentheses. It's like they were workshopping one of two titles, mm-hmm. and then they just included both of them in the opening credits. Yeah, there's there's some disagreement between, like, the editor and the director, <laughs> and it's yeah. just like, I think it should be called Evil Encounters. Uh, but in its native Italy, it is known under the title of La Casa Quattro, mm. which is an Italian number that I already knew, because Quattro is my preferred number of Fromaggios. That's... Definitely unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> I was not prepared for that at all. I can promise you that. <laughs> you know when you're in a nice Italian restaurant mm-hmm. and they serve you up a pizza pie and they maybe throw two or three fromaggios on there mm-hmm. and you go into the kitchen you say, how about one more? One more fromaggio. Let's go, one more. let's go quattro. Let's go quattro. Let's go mm-hmm. all the way. Yes, but uh, we'll talk about that and we'll talk about the, the fascinating trajectory of the La Casa series. Mm-hmm. Uh, lots to discuss there, but joining us, he should feel mm. like a good neighbor at this point. Because what, what, I, I met that copyright? Good neighbor? Feel like a good neighbor. It is. Nothing movies! Like a, feel like a good neighbor. Come like, on down. It's a State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State like Farm a good neighbor, State Farm is there. It yeah. sounds like a '70s folk tune. I can just see like feels like a good neighbor in like the wavy '70s font. Feel like a good neighbor. This podcast is going to be a full hour before we start talking <laughs> yeah. about the movie. All right, back back by before popular demand. Introduced. <laughs> All right, back by popular demand. Third time's a charm. It's Danny Marcord. Hooray! Hey, welcome back, buddy. I meant to do the the math before we started recording. Is it only your third episode? Now, we have to remember, of course, we, we have an episode that you recorded that didn't get released because of technical difficulties. Didn't we re-record that? We, well, we re- re-recorded a different episode. Yeah. Now, the question oh. is, how, ma- how many how many release episodes has Danny done? Uh, this would be his third. Because will- he, he did Son of Dracula, he did uh, Final Score, and now this one. This will be the third one. Okay, yeah. there we go. Mm-hmm. I'm, gl- I'm glad you did the math. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't doing the I math. I have not been keeping track. 
It is kind of disappointing that the one that we didn't release was the only one recorded in a proper studio. <laughs> We've been recording uh, at my place uh, for all the other ones. Yeah, but weirdly enough, the one we recorded in a proper studio is the one that ended up having the most amount of microphone feedback. Yeah. Uh, no- nothing against the studio that we recorded in. It was just one mic was not having a great day on, on that particular day. Danny, welcome back. Yes. Thanks for having me. This is going to sound silly, but it is the topic of our discussion today, so I'm just going to have to throw it out there. Linda Blair! Yeah. Anyone have any thoughts? No, I'm going to circle back on that because obviously uh, this is a this is a very specific career that we're talking about. We're talking about an actor who really was only known for one film, even though she did lots of other movies. Um, so I guess I'll rethink my question here and, and just ask you, and I'll ask Jameson too, because I don't actually know the answer to this question. A question I probably definitely should have asked at some point in time. Have either of you seen The Exorcist? And what are your thoughts on it? I have seen The Exorcist, and it was a incredible movie i saw it as an adult and i'm like this is gonna be crap it's from the 70s like graphics weren't invented yet <laughs> um, like nixon I- was in office <laughs> <laughs> graphics weren't invented yet everyone had to do everything live they just had to put people in front of a they literally broke a young girl's neck twisting it a full <laughs> Yeah, Linda Blair was actually little known IMDb trivia. Was actually, the third actor they brought in. Yes, they went. They went through two. Like, they went through two Reagans before then, they figured that and out. And then some pioneer was like, "Why don't we just make a puppet?" <laughs> yeah. So no, I had seen it, but I I went in with low expectations and was genuinely brought in. It was an incredible film, very thrilling, scary, all of the things that younger adult. I in my hubris, I thought that it was going to be silly, and it was not in the slightest. It was uh, very well done. Yeah, it definitely holds up uh, still to this day. It's. Definitely Definitely sure. one of one of the horror films that still has the impact today that it did back when it was released. Jameson, Exorcist thoughts? I have not seen it, and I've sort of been avoiding the Exorcist for a very specific and stupid reason. You wanted to see this movie first. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> my mother didn't like The Exorcist. Right. So back when uh, her and my dad were dating, I think they went to go see The Exorcist. And when I just, like, brought up The Exorcist in around Halloween one year, Mom just said, like, I don't like that movie. I thought it was stupid. Because, <laughs> like, like and she thought it was overhyped. And, the, like, the only scary thing about it was, it's just a girl that talks like this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, well, hot take from Mom there. She, she was displeased with it because she's very blunt when she doesn't like a certain thing. Uh, and so I was like, well, okay, well, if it's not good enough for my mom, then it's not good enough for her boy. <laughs> and you've just you've just never circled around to it. Never but, got I mean, around to it. As we often bring up uh, during our Halloween episodes, you're, you're not much of a, of a horror movie aficionado. To not really. With. I become more of a horror aficionado just by, you know, having to sit yeah, down. Yeah, by and, me forcing you to... Yeah. to uh, uh, <laughs> There's it, a lot about how my life has changed since I met you. Yep. <laughs> not for the better. That's, my, that's how most of my <laughs> friendships work. <laughs> Uh, me forcing them to do things that they'd rather not, but it's my only avenue of interest. The Exorcist is a very upsetting film. Mm. You know, obviously, it has the reputation that it has as one of the scariest movies ever made. I think at the time that would have been true. Yes. Yeah. I think there might be still arguably like some justification for maintaining that title. I'd say it's in the top five, definitely. Mm, okay. I think I think there have been some movies released in the past decade that you could argue are maybe like fighting for the Exorcist's crowd. Hereditary is the big one that kind mm. of comes to mind. But those two movies have a lot of DNA in common. When you put aside the whole demonic possession aspect of The Exorcist and the sort of war against good and evil and how that relates to the concept of Catholicism, there's lots of themes in The Exorcist, but overall, why I think it endures as a movie is that fundamentally, it's a movie that plays on the fears of what happens when your child gets sick. It's a movie about a mom whose kid gets this sudden illness that no doctors can quantify or come up with a reason, and she feels lost and terrified and no one will believe her. To the point that I maintain the scariest scene in The Exorcist happens early before the demonic possession really starts to take over, and her mom just brings her into the hospital for tests. That's a te- that's a terrifying scene in that movie, and it's very upsetting because they're running all these tests. They put like a needle into her neck, and like blood squirts everywhere. It's just it's very upsetting. You don't like seeing children in peril mm. or children ill, 
And yeah, I definitely feel like that is uh, something that keeps that movie resonant to the point that, you know, they're still making freaking sequels out of it. We got one last year that no one liked, and they're moving forward with yet another one with a different director. So we'll see what happens there. I feel like maybe they should just leave this damn franchise alone. Wasn't Linda Blair in that last one? Linda Blair showed up at the very tail end. She had like a little cameo. Did she vomit out pea soup? (laughs) She did very nothing. She gave her mom a hug. Oh, that's disappointing. She did. She has one line. And when I say it's a a tiny cameo, it's a very tiny cameo. Linda Blair largely retired from acting in general. If she does anything these days, she's doing things that sort of reference or parody her role in The Exorcist or she He's doing a documentary about, about, the, about exorcist. the exorcist. Yeah. <laughs> Riding that franchise into the ground. But I think, like, I don't think she seeks it out. I think, you know, the producers decide, okay, well, yeah. we have, like, this popular brand. We have this franchise that we can keep going to. And Linda Blair is still around. So let's just throw a dump truck of money at her. And <laughs> she'll she's come. not made of she'll... stone? Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds to me like the metaphor of a parent's concern for their child being sick. Yeah, that just sounds like that metaphor was lost on my mother <laughs> before she had kids. I don't hey, know. Look, no, it, Maybe if you had an illness when you were younger, your mom would have liked the movie better. She would have. Re- yeah. She, yeah. <laughs> what a priority <laughs> for her. Like, mom, I'm sick. If Quiet. Only, I'm, I'm rewatching The Exorcist. If only you were, a, down. If only you were a sickly child, she would have <laughs> well, she loved, loved this cinema <laughs> classic. <laughs> so the concept of child actors is a really kind of touchy subject to begin with. And Linda Blair's career really sort of highlights why it's so important to have people protecting kids in the entertainment industry. Like, there are lots of people that can abuse them and take advantage of them. And Linda Blair's career was not free of controversy and it was not free of strain on her emotional and physical well-being. She had a very public cattle with drug use. What I will say is that the, the, the bare amount of research that I did looking at where Linda Blair is right now, she seems like a lovely lady. It seems like she's come out on the other side of things. She has real big fun ant energy. Mm. Is what I is what I get from Linda Blair. Linda yeah. Blair would be like a fun guest at a cookout, and she would come and she would tell you all these crazy stories. Mm. Wait until I get to her dating history. That's oh, kind lovely. of that's <laughs> kind of the main thing. Mm. I'm pumping the brakes on her filmography, Jameson, because after The Exorcist, she basically never starred in a movie that anyone has ever heard of. <laughs> right. Uh, one, thing, one thing that I know from just like the barest amount of research I did on her is that she seems to do a lot of work for animals. Yes. Yeah. She's like, she's runs this one charity, I believe, that uh, that rescues abused dogs. Uh, it is the Linda Blair World Heart Foundation, which she founded in 2004, which rescues and rehabilitates abused, neglected, and mistreated yeah. animals. And so so any, any, anyone who does something like like that, like you're you're good in my books. Absolutely, yeah. Well yeah. done, Linda Blair. Uh, so yeah, Linda Blair. Uh, she was a child model at the age of five. Uh, Wikipedia says she appeared in over seventy commercials for Welch's grape jams. Which I'm just gonna say, too many commercials. How many different ways can we? Uh, can one little girl inform the viewing public of 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 jelly and jams? Like it's at the end of the day, it's. It's the same shit yeah. over and over again. Although, a mi- missed opportunity, she could have done the commercial as Reagan from The Exorcist. <laughs> this was before, this was before, Danny. <laughs> no, this but was a- before. after the fact, you know, to continue to milk the success of that, that film, true. go back and be like, you know, she's sick, she's vomiting out the pea soup, she's talking about mother sucking cocks in hell, <laughs> and then she takes, like, a Welch's grape jam and she's cured. It's taking the devil oh, out so of her. Oh, so it's sort of a play on a uh, hungry grab a Snickers type Exactly. Snickers. <laughs> You're not your that son. was all she needed. I mean, the <laughs> the easy layup there is that she just starts puking up the Welch's grape well, jelly. Well, that's that's poor advertising. Yeah, and right? so no one's gonna want to buy Welch's grape jam or whatever. But that's a memorable is. ad. <laughs> Yeah, after The Exorcist, sales on pea soup basically just like went right into the basement. Yeah, it was it was really hard. But yeah, you're right, Danny. Any any sort of viscous liquid can come spewing from her mouth, and and that's that's the that's the general. That's her legacy. That's, that's her legacy. Unfortunately, it is kind of. So yeah, she has a few she has a few bit parts before landing the role of Reagan McDeal, the little girl in The Exorcist, who is possessed by the demon Pazuzu. 
and is exorcised by an old priest and a young priest. Right. And it was a worldwide phenomenon. It was nominated for Best Picture. She was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. She actually lost to an even younger actress, Tatum O'Neill, who I believe was nine at the mm. time. So yeah, oh there was God. a real... Jeez. That was an interesting year for um, child performers at the Academy mm. Awards. Now the... Let's talk about peaking early. <laughs> Exactly. Nine yeah. years old, first Oscar nom. And I'm, I'm just realizing that The Exorcist is a buddy cop movie. It right? is, kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there is, there's a cop character in the movie, and then at the end of the movie, the one remaining priest, the one priest who's still alive, the last thing that happens in The Exorcist, spoilers for The Exorcist, the, the cop investigating the case and the priest go out to a movie together. And the film implies that these two went on to have a... A, a long and illustrious friendship. Wow. And they've seen Ooh. movies together. And at the end of the day, that's all you need. You just want a priest to go to the movies with. That's mm. what you do. So, the thing with Linda Blair in The Exorcist is that, at the time, there was a lot of speculation surrounding how much of the performance she did herself. Because there were two other actors that were sort of helping bring that performance to life. There was an actor who basically was her stunt double. And, mm -hmm. and handled mm -hmm. a lot of the more serious, heavy lifting that that movie had to do. She does a lot of convulsing. She does a lot of, like, writhing on the Riding bed. Riding the bed when it's shaking. Yeah. That would have been the yeah. one that got her neck snap. Well, <laughs> that's why you had the stunt. Now, we should, we should, we should preface by saying that, that no one's head was turned completely all the way around. Um, Linda Blair did suffer some injuries on the set of The Exorcist. It's funny that she had a Of course, it was a movie made in the 70s. Exactly. Yes. You, don't, you don't start a movie in the 70s without suffering a couple of bruises. Uh, no one uh, came out of the 70s unscathed. Famously, uh, The Exorcist, uh, uh, Ellen Burstyn, who plays her mother in that movie, ha got lifelong back problems from that movie where she's uh, a scene where she's supposed to open a door and then get uh, pushed back by a demonic force. They, of course, because it was the 70s, they accomplished this by tying a rope around her her, <laughs> her waist and, and yanking and it. And tying the other end and, of the bumper uh, of a car. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and she's, she said that, you know, like, I love that movie. I love I love the, uh, uh, the work that we did on it it's an endearing classic but uh yeah no it gave me lifelong back problems so so fuck william friedkin fuck everyone involved in this suffering for their art yeah and of course um as 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 your mom so brilliantly pointed out jameson it is a movie where a little girl talks like this yeah there was a there was another actress uh, mercedes mccambridge who famously did the the demonic voice or whatever so there were a lot of naysayers saying she doesn't deserve that oscar nomination other people were like doing like the heavy work for her or mm. whatever. Plenty of documentaries have been made about The Exorcist. I think it's fair to say with context that Linda Blair did a ton of heavy lifting and that the, the nomination is, is completely deserved. It was a lot of uh, uh, the director, William Friedkin, going out and trying to drum up publicity by saying like, oh, weird, creepy shit happened on this set. You're not going to believe it. Linda Blair, yeah. like she's like a spooky kid or whatever. See it for yourself, yeah. It, he was building up the mystique of the movie to sell the movie but as a result, Linda really got rung through the ringer of, like, like 70s journalism. Mm. And, like, a 15-year-old girl all of a sudden was, like, thrust into the spotlight of Hollywood. Yeah. And one really wonders if she was, like, ready or prepared for all of the people that were saying all this shit about her that they only, like, heard from, yeah. like, hearsay. I mean, on the be in the best of cases, like, no one is really prepared to be thrust into stardom like that. Like, least of all, I think, kids. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think, like, as a society, people are really hard on uh, on kid actors. I mean, the famous example is uh, the kid from The Phantom Menace, who just right. wanted to be an actor in a Star Wars movie. Uh, you know, probably every 10-year-old boy's and I, dream. And I, th and I think only recently has publicly come out and said, I finally found a small modicum of peace in my life. Mm. I'm, like, finally okay Mm. <laughs> in like my like early 40s or however yeah. old that kid is now yeah uh yeah poor didn't, guy didn't joffrey from game of thrones like the actor get death threats probably I, yeah mm, he I, took a big break from acting but i do believe he is he has finally returned yeah but, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting my piece out there now that uh, you know everyone take it easy on, on kid actors because when we get to talking about the movie i got some thoughts about <laughs> the kid actor in this movie <laughs> Fuck that small child. <laughs> oh boy, that small, probably Italian child <laughs> who doesn't actually understand the words that are coming out of his mouth. So I'll just breeze through the rest of Linda Blair here because I'm itching as much as you guys are to talk about. <laughs> There's plenty to talk plenty about. Plenty to this talk about this movie. So her immediate follow-up to the Oscar-nominated success of The Exorcist is the 1974 television film Born Innocent. 
uh, where she plays a teen runaway abuse survivor. Uh, the film was heavily criticized by several groups for its depiction of female-on-female -female sexual abuse, which I think in today's modern parlance we can all agree is something that definitely happens, but perhaps in 1974 that was a more uh, nuanced topic that I think people were... People weren't ready for people it. People weren't ready, really ready ahead, to have that. It was truly ahead of its time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Itching for a remake is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Let's get on it. <laughs> Bring Linda Blair back. Bring her back. She's playing the older lady now. Exactly. <laughs> now she's the one doing the abuse. Oh, God. It's really hard to make jokes about this stuff. Mm -hmm. After oh, that, uh, she's in Airport 1975. Either of you familiar with the Airport series? Isn't that the movie that Airplane spoofed? Kind Kind of yes and no. Airplane is literally spoofing a, a disaster genre. A specific movie, I believe it's called Zero Hour. Oh, okay, okay. That was like a cheap TV movie. Like lines of dialogue are taken verbatim right, from right. that movie. Like Airport, it's that same genre of like disaster movie type stuff. But yeah, basically, Airport was a series of movies where a famous cavalcade of celebrities gone into an airplane, and then something happens. Some shit goes down, and it's it's. Uh, there are snakes on the plane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something's always going down. I mean, snakes on a plane is in the grand tradition of the airport movies, okay. you know. So All it's right. like you know, like an engine goes off, or or someone has a bomb on the plane. Sure. This There's something on the wing. Yeah, something. <laughs> She's in airport 1975. I believe she plays a girl who is trying to get uh, a kidney, and she has to get to the hospital by like a certain point, and mm. uh, oh, or, oh, or the kidney explodes. There's problems on this airplane. <laughs> Yeah. Pulling that. This kidney needs to be going 50 miles per hour. <laughs> it slows down at all. That's why they took the Concorde. That's right. <laughs> Following that, she's in the TV movie Sarah T, Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic. Oh my god. Uh, which, it, it, it says exactly what it is on the tin, mm -hmm. uh, but it's an interesting TV movie because uh, it's an early film uh, for both her and and Mark Hamill, and it's directed by Richard Donner, who would go oh. on to direct the Superman films and Lethal Weapon and all right. of that. So it's an early TV movie for th for three people who it, it, who've it was, gone on to bigger and better huge, things, huge bigger yeah. better things. It was it was like released on TV in 1975, and then I believe it got a theatrical release a couple years later after both. Linda Blair and Mark Hamill became, like, marquee names, mm -hmm. basically. Okay. All right. Then 1977, she's back to the franchise that made her a star for Exorcist to The Heretic, one of the worst movies ever made. It's, it's absolutely impenetrable. It makes absolutely no sense. There's, like, scenes that take place in Africa. There's, like, they're in, like, this weird building with, like, autistic children who are, like, moving big, like, cogs around. It truly is... An impossible movie to try and quantify and describe in a couple of sentences. So I won't check even that one bother. Out. <laughs> I'm curious what your mom thought of that one. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> Probably I garbage. Loved it. <laughs> yeah. Nothing but, 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 but high marks to say yeah. about that. And then basically from there, she's just in a string of schlock. She just becomes like a schlock queen. Mm. She's in all of these super cheesy sounding movies. 1979, Roller Boogie. 1981, Hell Knight. 1983, Chained Heat, which is a women in prison movie. 1984, Savage Streets, where she's like fighting like a bunch of gang members, like it's a fucking Sega Genesis game. That one actually looks pretty fun. 19 all of these sound great. These all sound pretty good. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. 1990, she uh, directly parodies uh, her own performance in uh, The Exorcist right. for the first time. Uh, in the film Repossessed, right. which is a naked gun style parody also starring Leslie Nielsen as the priest. Mm. Uh, so she's not playing her character from The Exorcist. But, but she, come on, she's, she's playing, essentially playing. She's playing someone who was possessed as a kid and now as an adult she's possessed again. She's right. repossessed. Right, yeah. I've been, I've been meaning to try to watch it. It looks like one of those bad Leslie Nielsen comedies. It would definitely it would definitely be on brand for you, Jameson, to watch the parody of The Exorcist before before you see the exorcist. <laughs> hey, I, I saw Spaceballs before I saw Star Wars. Well, I think most of us did. I think, I, that was, I, think yeah. I might have too, That was actually. definitely the trajectory. That one's not so weird. <laughs> okay. Um, I definitely saw Spaceballs before I saw Alien. Mm -hmm. And then years later, I'm like, oh, that's what that that's means. Where it's from, yeah. That's what that yeah. joke is. <laughs> they uh, reprised their roles for that bit part. They so, did, indeed, yeah. In the yeah. proud tradition of that. Okay, so this is what I wanted to get to. At age 15, which, by the way, 
gross. Blair started dating singer Rick Springfield mm. of Jesse's Girl. Right. Which would be a cool brag, but again, age 15. Mm. Uh, things were different back then. Probably this, you, you can you can fill in the gaps in how this probably contributed to her drugs and alcohol. She, now, now I'm going to go through her, her dating history. It'll become apparent almost immediately that Linda Blair has a type. Okay. So she dated uh, Rick Springfield. She met at a concert at the Whiskey A Go Go, what she was doing there at the age of 15. Lord, Lord knows. Drinking. She also dated deep purple bassist Glenn Hughes, mm. guitarist Neil Giraldo, who would go on to marry Pat Benatar, Styx guitarist Tommy Shaw, and Jim Dandy Mangrum, the lead singer of Black Oak, Arkansas. She also dated Rick James for two years. Uh, the story goes, during a 1982 topless photo shoot for We Magazine, Blair told interviewers that Rick James was, quote, very sexy. And when James read the article, he immediately reached out to her. According to James's autobiography, it was apparently a love affair for the ages. It stayed with him for years. He even wrote a hit song, Cold-Blooded, about uh, his experience Cold with... Uh, yeah. mm. Okay. Uh, so that that song is about his relationship with Linda Blair. And, Crazy! And uh, in particular, uh, the cold-bloodedness of it refers to an abortion she had and didn't tell Rick James about. Now, I listened to that right before I came here. If you were to tell me that's what that song was about, no I clue. never would have guessed because it's a very funky song. Mm. It's a Rick James song! Yeah. It's a funky little beat, so it, that, that, to know that it has like this kind of tragic backstory to it is, yeah. is kind of wild. I was just going to ask if she was of age at this point. In oh, 19, I hope so. oh, in 1982, she absolutely would have been. Okay. She would have been in God. her 20s, but... Uh, yeah. Rick um, James is better than that. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely <laughs> definitely colors my, my thoughts on Rick Springfield. Not that I really had many thoughts on him to begin with other than, yeah, you did that one song. Yeah, Rick Springfield, gross. Mm. That's too young. Don't, don't, date, do, that. don't, don't date, do that. Don't date the children. So before we dive into this movie, I just want to briefly touch on La Casa, the uh, uh, series that this film is the fourth entry right. of. So, oh, that's where the Quattro comes from. They took it took it took the, the entire time <laughs> I did, to get to get about what I was fucking saying. I did not understand. I did not look into the movie's title. I just recognized that it was different than what I saw on the box. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I probably could have helped led you. with that. I probably could have led with that. I probably could have helped you out and called it La Casa Four, but no, mm. I wanted I wanted to stretch my my Italian and say Quattro. You know, like <laughs> I, I when I gathered up the poster for this movie for the YouTube thumbnail, that's where I saw that it is the fourth entry in something. And it makes a little bit more sense now, because when I was watching that movie, I, I was remarking to myself, like, this feels like it's a sequel to something, because they're not really setting up enough about this hotel setting for me. And uh, Also, yeah, it's not a casa, it's a hotel. It's a hotel, yeah. It's not a house. I mean, the hotel it, it was a house at one point in time. Was it? D did they clarify? I don't remember that. I don't remember that, no. I mean, what is a hotel if not a house for people who aren't uh, staying forever? It's a business. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a home. Well, we can we can hash this all out. We can. Really, <laughs> the rest of the podcast is about we this. It, we can let it, we can let it get I'll, this. Someone get like an Italian phrase book here, right? I'll get to the bottom of this. <laughs> so that feeling that you had, Jameson, that it's like, oh, we're not really learning much about this hotel. I bet this comes uh, from earlier. The, the La Casa series basically is a series in name only. Uh -huh. None of these movies are connected to one another. Oh, so it's just a bad film. These Perfect. Are, yeah. These are all standalone. <laughs> films. Now we have a bit of a history talking about this because we've covered plenty of Italian B-movies oh, yeah. on this podcast Some before. of my favorites. <laughs> so the thing with the Italian film industry is that at this point in time, they had this habit of retitling movies that weren't part of a series as part mm. of a series. The most obvious example of this is uh, the great uh, Lucio Fucci zombie movie, which is called Zombie 2. For years, North American film fans, you know, uh, before the internet came out, scoured film magazines trying to find Zombie 1. They couldn't find Zombie 1 anywhere. They could only find Zombie 2 uh, when it came to, you know, like their mom and pop video stores or whatever. It wasn't until years later that they found out that Zombie 1 uh, within Italy is just George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead, mm. which they just retitled <laughs> and released to Italian markets. Mm -hmm. So 
the thing with the La Casa series is, as I was doing uh, my research into this, IMDb, Wikipedia, Letterboxd, all of them, you know, like if a film is part of a series, it'll include links to the other films in the series that you can check them out. All of the sources that I just cited, they only had links to La Casa 3 and La Casa 5, okay. which for the record uh, are individual movies. La Casa 3 is a film called Ghost House. And La Casa 5 is a film called Beyond Darkness. These were all independent films that were uh, co-produced by Italy uh, under these titles. And then when they were released, the producer uh, said, like, they're part of this uh, series. Also, Trust uh, me on this. Take look, my word for uh, it. it and, and as we talked about earlier, uh, complaining about the fact that it's a hotel and not a house. La Casa, of course, means the house. That's what it, that's, that's what it means. So I looked around. I'm all like... Did they just start this at, like, number three? Does does La Casa 1 and La Casa 2, does, do those even exist? Is so, it like the Amityville Horror or something Oh, like you're that? really close. Oh, dang. Yeah. Casa 1 and Casa 2 do exist. We know them as The Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. <laughs> oh, come <laughs> on. <laughs> that's, that's, not a, that's not a house either. It's that's like a shack. A shack. <laughs> it's more of a house than a hotel. You gotta that, admit. You oh, know what? Kind I'll of more of a house. I would there, not yeah. pay to stay in that place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's La Casa 1 through 5. Yeah. Now, to make things even more confusing, are either of you familiar with an American horror series that is called... House. I know House MD. I know Doom I mean, House. I don't know what you were referencing. I'm not even doing that. Danny is, does. I do. Yeah, that is, that is the or the beginning of the internet. Yeah. Doom House? On the Something Wait, Awful forums. I feel like we've, t we've talked about literally this before. Doom House was a movie that was made by the administrators of SomethingAwful.com. It's just two guys fucking around in the house. It sounds really familiar. I don't know. I'm going to have to scrub back through My past guess episodes. Is I feel like we've you talked probably watched it and just not remembered it. I, that happens with a lot of things that, mm. uh, that, that enter my brain. Okay, so House is a horror film series that came out of the uh, 80s. Uh, it, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a it's a spooky ghost house series. The, the weird thing about uh, the series is House 1 has George Wentz in the cast. House 2 has John Ratzenberger in the cast. Huh. So that's kind of like the weird little footnote that it has. They, they're never together and they're in completely separate films. So uh, that's a series that's literally called House in North America. Right. When the La Casa series, the producers of La Casa, got to part 6... They decided, oh, let's finally get around to stealing from this series that, uh, that is also called House. Here's the weird thing, though. They started with House 2. House 1 is not canonically part of the La Casa series. Mm. It goes La Casa 5, the standalone movie. La Casa 6 is House 2. Brief sidebar about House 2. House 2 does have maybe one of the best subtitles of any movie ever. Is it in brackets? It's not, in, it's not in parentheses, <laughs> no. I just want to throw this out to the crowd. Think of, like, a, a really good house-based pun. What, what what would you assume would be, like, a good, like, house pun that you could use for a sequel to a movie called House? It's pretty obvious. All I can think of is the your mama joke that when she, <laughs> she, she sits, sits around the house. House 2, when she sits around yeah, the yeah. house, she really <laughs> sits around the house. House 2 is called House 2... The second story. Oh, oh that's clever. That's genuinely clever. clever. That's pretty clever. good. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, to close the book on this, La Costa 7 is House 3, The Horror Show. Now, to make this even more complicated, mm -hmm. House 3 was filmed in North America as the third entry in the House series. But when it got to editing and the producers saw it, they all came to the conclusion, this doesn't really have that much connective tissue to the two movies that came before it. Why don't we just take the subtitle of The Horror Show, drop House 3, and just release it as The Horror Show. So House 3 was a retitling of a movie that ended up getting retitled when it went to Italy. Mm. There's an extra wrinkle, though. Jesus Christ, I need, like, a cork board and exactly. a string. <laughs> this is a fucking Pepe Silvio moment if I've ever fucking heard of. So, this was before the advent of DVD. So, like, House 3 
or The Horror Show, got released in Italian cinemas as La Casa 7. Years later, when DVDs became a thing, The Horror they Show... They had to make a box set. Man, I, that poor bastard that had to track all this stuff down. <laughs> it's even more confusing. Now, the thing that it brings to mind the most is, is the localization of Final Fantasy. Because you get certain Final Fantasies that are released as, like, Final Fantasy 3, but they're technically Final Fantasy 6. Right, yeah. Um, so here, this, this, this additional wrinkle, when DVDs became a thing... The Horror Show was re-released on DVD in Italy, and when it came time to do the localization for The Horror Show, they called it La Casa 3, going off of the fact oh. that in North America, it's called House 3. So there are two different versions of The Horror Show in Italy. One is called La Casa 3, one is called La Casa 7. There is another La Casa 3, or, which is right. a completely different fuck movie! Off, fuck off with this, and I'm so pissed off that I'm gonna have to track down the poster <laughs> For all of these, oh my god! It's one, it's one Wikipedia page. Just, give, just give me that high. Oh. <laughs> all right, give me. But the, you gotta, just give me the fucking list. But you gotta do it on a cork board, and you gotta superimpose your head on the Charlie Day's body, mm -hmm. and you gotta just lose your mind while you. All right. It. Okay, so now that that's uh, all done with, uh, we can finally delve into. La Casa Four. We, we can enter the house. Yeah, we can, and we can we can do some witchcraft. There's witchery afoot. There's, there's witchery afoot. Mm -hmm. I genuinely. This is one I genuinely am not sure what we're going to title this episode, Jameson. There's so many options. It's witchery. It's, it's witchery. <laughs> All right, fine. All right. Well, uh, final thoughts, Danny. <laughs> not final thoughts. We have like an hour to go. All right. <laughs> Beginning thoughts about the movie? Sure. <laughs> I don't know. I was just my initial thought was it was actually better than I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a garbage movie, but there were parts of it that were genuinely good that was surprising to me. I did yeah. not expect them. Yeah, hey, hold I, on to that. Yeah, as we'll, we go into this break, we'll and when we there. come back, we'll expand more on on that on what Danny just said. Yeah. Well, stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. We're back. Witchery, which, which, which is what we decided to call it. It is directed by Fabrizio Laurenti. Mm -hmm. Now sounds familiar. Well, okay. The, Actually, he didn't he do one of the Ator movies? Well, okay. Here's the thing. Mm. So this movie is produced. By, by Joe D'Amato. By Joe D'Amato. Yeah. The director and producer of, of... like, Sexy Night Report and Hercules A Sex Adventure. And, <laughs> and previous episode, Ator for Quest for the Mighty Sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which in certain territories... Is oh, Troll 3. Is Troll 3, which <laughs> ties it back to the thing that I was talking about of Italy fucking looping in movies that aren't actually part Just to of fuck the, with us. the series. Now, if the name I say, Fabrizio Laurenti, sounds familiar, it, it, it shouldn't, but... It doesn't. I no. have tangentially brought it up before, because the movie that he makes after this, this is his first film, the movie that he makes after Witchery is a film called The Crawl which also got retitled as Troll 3. Oh my If you remember God. from that episode, there are two Troll 3s, much like there are two La Casa 3s out there in the world. As a footnote, I also want to point out that... Oh my God, let's talk about this movie soon. We will. I also, <laughs> just because I mentioned Troll... My also, brain is getting fried listening to this. I also wanted to point out, just because I mentioned Troll, La Casa 5 is directed by Claudio Fragasso, who directed Troll 2. Okay. Now, Troll 2 is Troll 2. <laughs> Troll 2 isn't anything else. Troll 2 is its own thing. It's just Troll 2. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we go. One of the worst the... movies ever made. But I can put a cap on that. All yes. right. Yes. Yeah. Which I still have never seen. Oh, you haven't? Really? I feel like I have at this we, point. We I gotta, feel like... We gotta sit down and watch some of these. Is there is, is there anything to it that it hasn't been part of, like, the, the, the real of... Oh, it's the worst movie ever made. Look at, like, these, like, individual scenes or whatever. Like, I really don't feel like Troll 2 was gonna surprise me all that much. I think just to give yourself some context and to be part of that conversation, I think it's worth it. You know, much the same way that, like, people should just check out The Room. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll watch Troll 2 if you watch The Exorcist. Deal. Deal! <laughs> there we go. does not sound like a fair trade. <laughs> <laughs> one of these is not like the other. <laughs> one is a timeless classic. And the other one, the other one is The Exorcist. But... <laughs> <laughs> but 
But to be fair, I'm sure if I made my mom watch Troll 2, she also would not like it. So I feel like it's their parallel stories. Okay. All right. So La Casa Quattro. No, sorry. Witchery. Mm-hmm. Or I guess witch Evil Bo- Encounters. Evil Thank- Encounters. Yeah, however you slice it. <laughs> it opens with a pregnant woman running in the, uh, the, the like on, on the shoreline away from some pilgrims. And she's running pretty good for a pregnant woman. Some some uh, some Amish uh, farmers with scythes. Mm-hmm. Who pitchforks. Are, and pitchforks who are none too happy that she is uh, pregnant on this island. Mm. There is no other context given. No, <laughs> no, basic, no context is given. I mean, like, a, a small amount of context is given later on in the movie. It does not help. <laughs> I mean, we can deduce from this opening scene that these people must think that this lady is a witch. Mm-hmm. She might be. Again, yeah. it's pretty vague. Yep. I mean, the movie is set in Massachusetts, but they never specify if it's like Salem, which would make a ton of sense, <laughs> given that it's about witches. Yeah. <laughs> now, the funny thing about this scene is like, yeah, it's a chase scene. The the, the way that the, the, the choreography of this chase scene plans out is really funny, because sometimes the pilgrims are hot on her heels, mm-hmm. and like the very next shot... She, she's gotten, like, a burst of energy because she's way ahead of them. Yeah, yeah. She eventually gets into this abandoned hotel, or I guess it's not abandoned at the time that, that she gets there. Mm-hmm. It looks the same no matter what era we're looking at it. Um, <laughs> but, Incomplete is but how like, that There's, like, looks. one moment where she's, like, running down a hallway trying to get into rooms. All of the doors are locked. And, like, I I noted while I was watching it, this is, this is the longest goddamn hallway in the world because, like, the pilgrims come up the stairs, she runs ahead a little bit, tries to open a door, cuts back, the pilgrims are still coming up the stairs, she, like, moves, like, half a half an inch down the hallway. Yeah. They're, like, a little bit close. Like, it's ridiculous, the spacing it's, of it Yeah, all. it's like that part in uh, Monty Python, the yes. Holy Grail, where yes. Lancelot is, like, continuously <laughs> shown in the same shot running on the field. Uh, yeah, and the pregnant lady runs to the window and jumps out. You know, she falls to her death. And we smash presumably, cut, presumably, and we smash cut to uh, Linda Blair waking up from a dream, like she dreamed this true story. <laughs> okay, so this is a genuine question. Mm. Oh, and Linda Blair is pregnant. And Linda Blair is pregnant. Yeah. Yes, this is a, this is a genuine question. So there's there's uh, there's a couple of actresses in this movie. One of whom is Linda Blair. Uh, the other one is uh, 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 this character Leslie who we'll get to in a second, uh-huh. who's played by an actress named Leslie Cumming, I, one assumes mm-hmm. that's her actual name. <laughs> Much like these movies, a lot of these actors had names that weren't really the names that they were born with. But so there's Linda Blair, we have this Leslie Cumming actress, who's an actress that looks a lot like Linda Blair, mm-hmm. uh, to the point that I was a little confused in the early scenes. I was, I was confused as well. I trying to figure yeah, out yeah. Uh, which one they were. And then we have the woman in this opening, now, this is a genuine question. Is this a third actress? Or is this one of them? I genuinely do not know. There's no... What did the credits say? Uh, like... Nothing? They're, <laughs> not cred- they're not crediting, like, every background character. Okay. Or whatever. Oh, crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, I really could not tell because it's confusing because it's meant to be a flashback to something that happened on the island earlier. Mm-hmm. It's tied to, I guess, this film within the film that we'll have to get to at a certain point. But I, once it was over, I went back and I watched the opening scene again. I still can't tell if it's this Leslie actress. Uh, it's, I don't think it's Linda Blair, but, like, I, 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 I can't tell. I genuinely can't tell if this is a person who's already I in the movie or if, if she's only in this one scene. Didn't notice that at all. All right. <laughs> well, it'll be a mystery for the ages, then. Yeah. One thing that I did notice throughout that opening sequence was the soundtrack. The fucking theme is like Morse code. It was giving me a headache. I definitely picked up that it was like more intense than it needed to be, and like it, it definitely came in at, at odd times. Like it, it's very repetitive. It's yeah. repetitive, and it had uh, it had. Um, I lost my train of thought because someone is smoking some dank kush yeah. uh, uh, in the apartment next to Jameson right now, and it's uh, it's permeating. The hell was I gonna say? Something about weed. Something about weed. <laughs> something about uh, Linda Blair. Uh, I don't know. We can move on. We can move on from that. So yeah, Linda Blair wakes up. She's 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 having a dream. She's pregnant, and cut back to the island. And this is where we meet this this woman, Leslie, mm-hmm. who I thought was Linda Blair for like yeah. half of a scene before I realized, oh no, wait, she looks different right. from Linda Blair. 
and she's a noticeably worse actress. I thought she was drunk. Yuri, I hope you realize how much I appreciate you coming here to do these pictures for my book. It really means a lot to me because I believe in what I'm writing, but I need proof. It's just sometimes I feel confused, even scared, to find what I'm looking for. She's slurring her words. She has like a weird Californian accent uh, here and there. The thing with these Italian B movies is you you have to factor in one of two possibilities. One, if you see these actors in here that are like noticeably terrible, they're either Italian actors who don't have a firm grasp on the English language, or indeed have no grasp on the English language and are saying all of their lines phonetically. Yeah. Uh, so they literally have no idea what they are saying. Yeah, or what other people are saying to them, which makes acting really hard. Or they're just genuinely terrible actors. Yeah. We, we truly don't know. There's not enough information about the actors in this movie. The ones that have, like, very few credits, and those credits are other Italian movies, I'm going to assume their names are, like... Sergio Monteverdi, mm -hmm. but they changed it for they changed it to to Leslie Cummings yeah. for this movie. Uh, so yeah, so, so she's playing Leslie. Yeah, she's doing research for this book on the the history of the hotel, uh, its ties to the occult and uh, witchcraft, and she's visiting this uh, island without permission because it's a private island, and they just apparently snuck their way onto there. And she's accompanied by her photographer boyfriend, played by David Hasselhoff. It is truly amazing that we have not done a David Hasselhoff movie in the six years that we've yeah, been Yeah, you'd think he would have showed up by he now. He would and... have popped up uh, sooner or later. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Danny, uh, Jameson mentioned you, you, you were more into this movie for the Hoff of it all than than the uh, than the Linda Blair of it all. That's completely understandable. He is he has he has the he has the bigger career certainly of of the two of them. Well, and I also think that he has. Possibly more just due to his later career, like being in the Spongebob movie and so on. Like, I, I had... That's the, the highlight, certainly. Yeah, yeah, but, like, the expectation of some degree of self-awareness in a yeah, corny kind of a film. A camp factor to yeah. it. Yeah. But this was sort of released in, in during the time. Definitely prior when he... Uh, maybe he thought more of himself as an actor at yeah. the time. Yeah. There, this definitely was released around the time that he, he was, at the very least, trying to take himself seriously. Uh, the year this film is released is also uh, the the debut of the first season of Baywatch. So it's, oh, a, big, okay. so it's a big year for him. He was a big get for this movie. It's, well, it's, yeah. Well, I mean, maybe not yet, actually. Well, he had done Knight Rider is the thing. Oh, so that's of course, right. he yeah, had yeah, yeah. He had the big success. So he TV was a show. He was a TV star. He was a TV star, and I don't know the, the the time frame of this, but the other thing to remember about Hasselhoff is that he's huge in Europe for his singing career, mm -hmm. uh, more so in Germany than Italy. But I think he still has a, a lot of fans down there. Uh, just for his singing skills. Sure. So, so yeah. that's that's the Hoff in this. They should have made it a musical. They should. I mean, <laughs> could have helped. He he name checks the Phantom of the Opera in his in his he, in his opening does, scene because yeah. we have a little Hasselhoff jump scare mm -hmm. uh, when he sneaks up behind his girlfriend mm -hmm. and he says, "Who were you expecting, the Phantom of the Opera?" Uh, one important thing to note about this relationship is that Leslie is a virgin, and David Hasselhoff seems very pushy to get them to uh, consummate their relationship. This is... Yeah, go ahead, Daddy. I, uh, potentially spoiling something else, so I don't know if it's better to mention it now or later, but when the Lust character was being murdered, I was thinking to myself, with how creepy and pushy and not really respecting the boundaries of <laughs> Leslie, that uh, why isn't he being the one murdered for this? Yeah, he's, 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 he's the lust. He's, he's the lustful one. He's very lustful lecherous. One. Mm -hmm. This is something that you would see in, in narrative film uh, from this era that, you know, it bothered me when I was watching it. It's part of this thing that contributes to... Uh, the psyche of young boys when they're trying to figure out how relationships work. And it's yeah. just mm. more of this bullshit machismo where it's like, if you're in a relationship with someone and she and she doesn't want to be sexually active or whatever, just just hold on. Just keep mm. just keep pressing it. Yeah. And eventually she'll come around or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like it nowadays you you look at this and you're just all like, buddy if, Plenty of fish in the look, sea. <laughs> if sex is important to you, but it fundamentally isn't important to her, you need to end the relationship. Yeah. You just need to. 
And like, look, if she doesn't want to have sex with you at your 80s Hasselhoff, she's not going to have sex with you at your 90s Hasselhoff. <laughs> you got you to read the writing, buddy. I did think that this relationship did not make any kind of sense. They, he was not interested at all in the occult or the book she was writing. He was, like, critical of it. Well, but and- he, ch- he changes his opinion, like, mid-sentence sometimes. Like, at first, they, they're talking about, like, uh, this this book that you're putting together with the occult and everything, uh, it's it, it's bringing you down, it's bringing your mood down, uh, it's obviously leading to, like, these nightmares or whatever. Yeah. By the way, thanks for bringing me on to this book. I'm taking all the photos for this book. Yeah. I'm excited for this book. Which is it, Hoff? Yeah. Do you like the book or do you not like the book? Well, I think, uh, the, the way I interpreted that was it was... Maybe not necessarily selfish, but him sort of recognizing that he likes what he does. He likes photography, and it's an objectively gorgeous sight. And so that was how I interpreted that. He doesn't care about what she's doing, but he's happy to engage in his hobby in support of that. So I didn't necessarily see a contradiction there, but like I definitely did not see any indication that they had anything in common because yeah. uh, he liked photography, she liked writing, he wanted sex, she didn't. <laughs> like, there was literally nothing that they had in common. He just kept... The basis of the relationship seemed to be he was wanting to have sex with her. And it goes back to what you were saying, Kaz, of, like, what a young boy watching that might see of, like, well, a relationship is trying to get sex and nothing else. The only time he ever shows any interest in, like, the history of this hotel and the research that she's doing is when she reads off this one passage in the book that specifically says there's an infantile superstition that virginity is about purity. And he's just like, huh? Uh, uh, see, even, even the, the book's book, agreeing with even me on the book's this. going on it, yeah. <laughs> and look, we're jumping ahead to the end here, but, I, I mean, um, part of the, part of the, 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 the evil witch's grand master plan is that she needs the um, the blood of a virgin. Uh, I was half expecting David Hasselhoff to have a moment being all like, oh, did you hear that? Needs the blood of a virgin. Quick, we gotta get out of here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me five minutes. That's all I need. I'm and then, doing this to save your life, I'm baby. doing this to save everyone. <laughs> this is important. I got it. To defeat the witch, we have to bang. Let's do it, babe. <laughs> uh, all right. So speaking of the witch, we do encounter her uh, on the mainland when Linda Blair is going about her day and we see like the the woman in black. The woman in black is what she's referred to. Yeah. Which, sorry, which, which, sorry. The, there she is, the woman in black. Oh god, the fucking kid. <laughs> we'll get okay, let's just Alright, so One thing at a time. <laughs> yes, please. Alright, so uh Linda Blair's walking around town and she's walking by a construction site and uh, an eye beam nearly falls on her, but the witch uses her like light bending powers on her on her brooch <laughs> or whatever to, to temporarily blind her from you know walking in the path of this falling beam. Oh, theme. was she saving Linda Blair? She was saving oh, Linda that, Blair. Oh, that, yeah. that see that makes way more sense. Cause she needs Linda Blair's baby. She mm-hmm. needs the baby for the sacrifice or whatever. Yeah. So I was wondering why she was doing this final destination yeah. bullshit. But no, she was she was saving Linda Blair so mm. she can come to the island. Yeah. Right, right, but, right, uh, right. But this scene sort of highlights the level of special effects that we'll be accustomed to in this movie, <laughs> which is a lot of, like, 1980s light effects, blur effects that are painted onto the film stock itself. But then when uh, Linda Blair gets a good look at the witch, she vanishes in a very shitty edit. <laughs> an edit cut. That there's one. lots of those, like, terrible edits. There's, 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 there's an edit that's just for a car turning on. Mm-hmm. Did either of you notice? that like a character got into a car and then there was like a very clumsy cut between like one scene of another and then the headlights are just on Mm -hmm. and it's all you needed to cut that together to turn the car on (laughs) surely there was a way to edit around this maybe it didn't it wouldn't start (laughs) well i think this was the first year that graphics had been invented right Mm. so (laughs) you really you really hung up on graphics (laughs) that's the technical term yeah (laughs) Uh, and also, uh, we meet uh, Tommy. That's his name, right? The, the yes, shitty yes. actor kid. Uh, this kid's a horrible fucking actor. Uh, among among many, uh, mm-hmm. a horrible actor among many. I don't know what's going on with this kid. Like he's just, yeah, he's he's absolutely I, terrible. I think that kid was drunk. <laughs> yeah. No, like he's slurring his words. He's not projecting at all. It has to have been the producer's kid or something because there's no fucking way that this kid passed an audition. <laughs> a, lo- a lot of these Italian B movies do us the service of like dubbing over the the Italian actors' performances. Mm-hmm. I feel like 1990 Bronx Warriors mostly dubbed over yeah. with with other people. This movie largely doesn't do dubbing. It seems like the actors are 
speaking on the set, but yeah, yeah the, the... This kid desperately needed someone to he dub really his He really needed someone to dub dub it over. It would have been fine, because he would have been a kid. It yeah. was fine. Yeah, absolutely. He doesn't have much to do. Mm. But we meet uh, Linda, the rest of Linda Blair's family, mm-hmm. uh, and we, we kick things... The plot kicks off, as it is, uh, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah, we meet her mother, Rose, and her father, Fred. Yeah. And Rose has seemingly bought the hotel on the island. Yeah. She turned it into a supper club? Some kind of, like, a resort, or maybe. I don't know if she's, like, planning to, to fix it up or anything, but um, they, they're they buying the hotel. They have bought it sight unseen? Pretty much, yeah. No, they say that explicitly. Yeah. yeah sight unseen. She's... And maybe it's seeded that the woman in black has sort of been manipulating things behind the scenes and pulling the strings or mm. whatever, but we get really no context as to why this woman has has bought this hotel. We don't really know what she does for a living. No, but she's she's just well-to-do and uh, and money-grubbing and very mean. <laughs> and yeah, her she's hus- very mean to everyone. And her husband's, you know, kind of a... I, I wouldn't say like a pushover, but he seems like very... He's very hand-packed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very disinterested in pretty much anything that's going on. He's also one of the lustful characters in this movie. There's a lot of people that could have been... Basically all of the men. All the are, men are, are the lustful characters. In, yeah. in this, including Tommy. That was yeah. a big problem. We had to. That's why we needed mm-hmm. to dub over most of him. And they had to hire a new architect uh, to, to fix up the house. Because it's all of the machinations of the woman in black. Which which seems weird to me. Like, I... All right, in, in this kind of story where there's, like, this old woman ghost or whatever haunting this hotel... She should be confined to that hotel. I don't get why she's like. She's walking. not a ghost. She's a witch. Yeah, she gets out and about quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems odd to me that like she's very. Like, she's doing a tunnel leg work for, yeah. for for such an old woman. She's got magic. It's not hard for her. She just <laughs> fucking teleports. Exactly. Or whatever. It's not like she's like catching a fairy over James. So right, she's fair. just closing her. But she's just. <laughs> She's she's t- twitching her nose. Right. And she's then using she, the yeah. the she cl- light bending. Yeah. <laughs> with her. Yeah. She has like her little jewel mm-hmm. on her on her thing that sends her to like the witch dimension. Yeah. Or whatever the fuck's going on there. Oh, and yeah, and I guess like she does like sort of appear in reflective surfaces yes. every once in a while, which never startles anybody. Like they they see an old woman like in the reflection, and they're just like, oh. Uh, you're not going to scream at a site like that. <laughs> so oh. we overhear from the dad that their architect, something's happened to their architect, uh, and but and the mom immediately says it's fine because I actually know another architect. It was referred to me by by a friend of mine. I have her number right here. Call this other architect, oh, yeah. uh, and this is where we meet uh, Linda. Uh, who is who is this new architect? She talks to Fred over the phone. And he says, "Yeah, we got your number from Walter." And she has this moment where she's like, "I don't know any Walter." Oh well, I guess I'll go to this th- island with you all. Yeah, a lot of trust uh, from this lady, and she is a very promiscuous lady. I feel like a 1989 sensibility uh, would want us uh, to call this woman a slut. Mm. Uh, I I am I will not. Uh, I feel like we've moved on from this archetype since this movie was out. She's just a lady who knows what she wants. She's a career-oriented woman in the '80s, which and she likes means to get. She has to die. <laughs> <laughs> but she likes to get down. That's right. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. We no. should. But but according to this this woman in black, no, we need. She specifically has manipulated things behind the scenes mm. so that this lady architect can come to. I say lady architect because the, the plot the plot requires, demands it demands yeah. it of me um, but this particular architect has to come to the island largely because she is promiscuous yep. that's the only reason that she's here mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. this was the only promiscuous woman in America at the time who was an architect <laughs> it was an arch- there was only one that was a, that was a very thin field <laughs> yeah. because it wasn't yeah it, it was it was hard out there for for lady architects in the 80s, particularly <laughs> ones who got around. Mm-hmm. It was a big problem. So just a quick note on the casting here. Uh, Rose, uh, the mean old woman, is played by an actress named Annie Ross. Either of you ever see Superman 3 with yeah, Richard yeah, Pryor? Yeah, yeah. So this woman is part of uh, an inadvertent childhood nightmare for uh, a lot of kids who sat down to watch. Oh, she she's the uh, one that becomes like that computer woman, that yeah, robot she's, woman. She's yeah, she's the villain's sister who becomes like a robot woman right. near the climax of the movie in a very terrifying fashion. Slightly even more so than what happens to her in this movie. Yeah. The, Linda, the architect, is played by Catherine Hickland, who at the time of filming was married to David Hasselhoff. Oh, wow. Uh. I think we've been calling Linda Leslie previously till now. Is that... No, Leslie 
is Hasselhoff's Carrie's oh, girlfriend. Right. Yeah, oh, Hasselhoff's my God. movie all, girlfriend. All his all real girlfriend is playing Linda. Mm. All these white his women. His real look life the same. wife. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. All these women. Well, she's blonde. Yeah. She, and, this is how you can tell her apart from the other right. women. It's because okay. she's so, blonde. All right. So Leslie is the movie girlfriend. Yes. Linda is the real life girlfriend, and Linda Blair is the star. Oh my God! I didn't even think of Linda Blair. <laughs> oh You're my right. God. Yeah. We forgot to mention Linda Blair's name is Jane, but we're just going to call no, her it's Linda, Linda Blair. Blair. Yeah. So 1989 is really interesting. So David Hasselhoff stars in this movie with his then wife. Also, according to Wikipedia. He divorces Catherine Hickland in 1989 and in the same year marries his second wife. Mm. So a busy 1989 for Hasselhoff. Baywatch debuts, he gets divorced, and he gets married again. And of course, La Casa 4 comes out. So it all comes together. Finally, Freddie Brooks is played by an actor I'm not familiar with, but his name is Bob Champagne. And I would really... That's all I have to say about that. That is 100% the name that he was born with. (laughs) (laughs) Really? You don't think... You don't think this is an Italian actor and it's like, I need to change my name for this movie? It's a very uh, Homer Simpson style of... uh, yeah, uh, I want to change my name to yeah, Max Power. Max Power <laughs> type thing. Yeah. But it's just, yeah, I just wanted to point that out because that's... That's a great name. That's fucking that's cool. cool. So, solid choice. Hi yeah. there, Robert Champagne. It works for both. It works with Robert and Bob. It's cool either way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so they go to the to the, wherever this hotel is. They meet up with uh, the real estate agent who decides to foist this job onto his son <laughs> for whatever fucking reason. This is a really funny line that this guy has here. This th- this real estate agent is also one of the worst actors in the fucking movie. He's mm. terrible. Every line he has is very strange. Mm. Um, but he had one line that made me laugh in this introductory scene uh, where he says, like, uh, my son will take you out to the island. We're one family here. Mm-hmm. And he says it like that, which makes me think that that was something that he was like rehearsing in the mirror by himself earlier. Where he's just like, we're one big hap. No. Nope. No. Nope. We're not one right. big. No. Nope. We're the... one family. <laughs> that is 100% the line from the self made commercials that he makes for late night television, yeah. where he's like the actor, yeah. uh, like used car dealership yeah. style, yeah. where it's yeah. like, come to this real estate. We're one family we're one... here. Come to one family real estate. <laughs> You'll get a Alan house from one family. Alan yeah. and Son Realty Co. We're one family. <laughs> um, yeah, this this uh, real estate agent is a, he's a bit of a motor mouth. He drops, the, the real estate agent's son. The real yeah the, yes. Well, he he is a real estate he, agent. He, yes, he, but when his father leaves, he becomes the real estate exactly. agent. Exactly. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And so he's saying that oh yeah, like it's it's a it's a wonderful house. Uh, you know, people don't have been sort of avoiding it because of the superstition. He describes it as witches and rainbows and shit. That's that's <laughs> one of my favorite lines. Yes. <laughs> and he's the guy who uh, is like making flirty goo goo eyes with the pretty architect. Even though I think she has a boyfriend, but whatever. Like, she does. Well, but it's because she's, uh, for lack of a better word, a slut. Right. Like, right. That is, she's she has a, a sinner. She mm-hmm. has a male friend who we see in the the opening scene. You know, in in the stage of undress, hanging out mm-hmm. in her apartment, and is disappointed when she has to go to work. Yep. Um, and he should be disappointed because as soon as his lady leaves his side, she immediately makes eyes for someone else. But you know what? It was the late 80s mm. and she was a, she was a career-oriented woman yep. mm. and she had she had no time to think about the hearts that she was breaking along the way. She had to move or how she to go. Be, how she'd be using like a demonic ritual. I should say the real estate agent the, the son, anyway, looks more like an older Matthew Broderick than current Matthew Broderick. <laughs> he sounded like <laughs> Matthew Broderick too. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, it's welcome a, to this island. It's a, it's a it's a bit of a fixer upper. I, I definitely have to say. Oh my god! When the um, when the mother goes into the house and she's like, "It's going to cost me a fortune to fix up this place," and it's like, "No, it's not." Get a couple of friends to help move out the few bits of furniture that's around. Hire like a painter, and you're done. This is like a structurally sound looking house. That's what the real estate agent said. Yeah, he just said it. She's just a being paint. a bitch. And if you're if you're not happy about it, maybe you shouldn't have bought a property sight unseen. <laughs> <laughs> madam it's almost like because again this is another like confusing thing where the real estate agent is showing them around the house they've brought the architect with them i guess to give them an estimate of how much work that they have to do mm. but he's showing them the property as if she hasn't already bought the damn thing mm-hmm. it's her she owns the damn thing yeah. it's all like the white. ink is dry yeah. on, the, on the lease You're, <laughs> you own this now you have sunk this family before we go further i do want to point out because it seems like we've passed this part of the movie and i sure. really wanted to touch on it as we do quite B- often before they go to the island 
sweet little Tommy is warned by a, a little girl in a wheelchair right. about the island. Mm-hmm. And I saw that and I was just thinking, you know, that's that's some good diversity in this movie. They're really <laughs> they're really progressive yeah. about including right. a, a, lo- a young girl in a wheelchair. And I don't know, it just it just stuck out to me as so that's clearly not what they're doing. They're uh, I don't know. It's no, but that was the, the you're right. That is the one token diversity higher on this. Yes, movie. this is a very white. It's a very movie. white film. Yes, yeah. I, I was really concerned when I saw that little girl in a wheelchair because I have this thing where you don't ha- you don't have like a person in a wheelchair in a movie unless you plan on unfortunately doing something awful with them in the wheelchair. That's but they didn't. Because no, she, it's she, a, she, it's she survives a, the movie. That's a true case of like appropriate progressive hiring. They're just like this. <laughs> she's per- just a person. James. She's just she a just person. Lives. Yeah, uh, that's her life in good. a wheelchair. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, because <laughs> the theme of this movie is setting things up that the movie is never going to circle <laughs> no, around back no. to. Going back to something earlier that, that we didn't discuss. So David Hasselhoff and uh, his girlfriend are on the island and they're gathering information for this book that she's writing and there's a moment where she gets really excited she's like David Hasselhoff get your camera come on come on over here and they film like this lens flare like two minute sequence where there is something happening with like prismic light Mm -hmm. or whatever and the woman from the from the opening scene who jumps through the window she's like superimposed on it and Hasselhoff is snapping snapping like a shutter bug Mm -hmm. and they're taking all of these photos and then this and then the scene ends Mm -hmm. and me like an idiot was like well, surely they'll circle around back to that. Uh, they'll probably explain what, what significance that has or, or, or what that has to do with anything going on in the story. It's mentioned again exactly one time mm-hmm. when the family finds Hasselhoff hiding in the house and, and he tries to uh, play it off with like, oh, we're just taking photos for a book. We're, we're here to, to snap photos of, of the witch's light. Mm-hmm. And then someone asks, oh, what's the witch's light? And then the real estate guy just waves away. It's just like, ah, it's just some witchery bullshit. Rainbows mm. or whatever, and it's never brought up again. Mm-hmm. What was that? <laughs> it's like, it, like on this day, uh, at this time, there will be like a blinding strobe light effect. Uh, it felt like something that was supposed to be significant, mm. and then they just genuinely forgot that they introduced it, and they never got around yeah. to actually explaining what it was, why yeah. it happens at certain times of day, mm. what what the. Uh, what the significance? What the of significance it. of it is? It it's just—it's the evidence of there being a witch in this uh, in this hotel and the witchery that goes around it. I think it was the reason for David Hasselhoff to be in the movie is what that thing was there for. <laughs> they needed him to photograph something. I just want to see some cool crystal shit. Yeah, or whatever. And he... If I'm not getting lucky, I at least want to see a light show. <laughs> <laughs> Get a light show out of it. Oh, this movie has lots of light shows. Uh, so the, the witch strands everybody on the island when she kills the uh, the ferry boat captain she uh, strings him up in the netting and then she uh, sets the boat adrift and yeah they are trapped on the uh, the mainland the real estate agent assures people that well when my when my dad finds out that uh, we're trapped here he'll uh, he'll send for help uh but we've got to camp out here for the night you know when they killed the sailor i well I, re- looking back you know because there was the uh, greed, which we'll get to soon, and the lust, which we've already talked about. I thought, because he was a clear alcoholic, he's like pulling a Mickey out of his jacket, mm-hmm. like normal people don't do that, and he's drinking at like 10 a.m. Avarice! Yeah. And, uh, well, gluttony was what I was thinking. I suppose that's yeah. Um, yeah. And I was like, is this just seven? Is this movie seven? <laughs> they really should have leaned into, okay, I thought, we're doing the full seven deadly sins yeah. here. So we got the lustful one, we got the greedy person. They have seven characters. They have every, one of them could have been like the arc Type that has like yeah. the ironic punch. or like wrath or something and, like, like maybe David Hasselhoff was abusive. Yeah, and, like he gets killed for that. Yeah, you know, one of one of the parents is pride. No, the the real estate agent's prideful because he always talks about his dad and how his dad's gonna rescue. Yeah, him. someone it? someone's eating a piece of candy and Tommy the little boy's all like, "I want that." And the witch is, "Oh, envy! Oh, that's one of them." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got you, Tommy. <laughs> yeah. So the, now they're going into detail over the the, the history of the witch itself, the, who was apparently this. Old movie actress uh, whose looks had faded, and then like she lived in obscurity at this hotel, cut herself off from uh, the rest of society, and now she's just a witch haunting this place. And what this has to do with the opening scene of the pregnant woman throwing herself through the window is question mark? Pointless. Exposition. They're definitely related in some way, yeah. but it is it's 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 very hard to yeah. 
to discern. Uh, this is a German actress, uh, Hildegard Lund, playing the uh, woman in black. Producers apparently courted and desperately wanted uh, cinema legend Betty Davis to play this role. Mm. Uh, and uh, she uh, understandably had better things to do, <laughs> uh, mainly being like 92 <laughs> or something along the, the, the lines. Here. I like how the movie projector comes on and they're just watching this like pretentious art house film of watching the woman, you know, walk around like a field <laughs> getting chased by the pilgrims. So the that's... film, the film projector turns on. Hasselhoff has the classic moment where he holds up the plug of the film projector and is like, I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and if we haven't mentioned it before, the two groups are now sort of coming. Combined yeah, now, yeah. you know, it's... All parties. They weren't... Better. Hasselhoff and the girl aren't supposed mm. to be there, but mm. no one really... Yeah, yeah no one did. minded. They got yeah, on no. very well. They don't yeah. really suffer any sort of consequences. It is explained that uh, Hasselhoff and his girlfriend came over in, like, a little boat, mm. which he keeps referring to as a Zodiac. I had to look it up. That was a... No, that's a real term for a that, little... That's a little, yeah, a little dinghy or whatever. With, a, with an outboard on yeah. it, yeah. But they, the, the explanation that they, they keep... Multiple characters keep saying over and over again is that the waves are too choppy. Mm -hmm. and they the can't, storm. The horrible storm. Horrible storm. Yeah. You'd be, it's suicide to get out there. You can't get on this island. Now, Meanwhile, it's clear as day and it's smooth when it, sailing. It, when it like applies to the scene that they're talking about, and they're, 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 they, they do cut to footage of a kind of choppy wave, but there's plenty of establishing shots of this water. Yeah, that ocean is smooth as fuck, boy. There's not a cloud it's, in the not sky. Not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> So, uh, Linda Blair separates from the group, and she goes to uh, one of the washrooms, and she drops, like, some nausea pills in, uh, into the tub, and uh, as she reaches down into it, she is pulled into a red vortex on her way L to the witch. L literally my favorite part of this movie. <laughs> all, it happens, all the vortex scenes? It happens, all the vortex scenes, it happens more than once, and it's funny every time. It was it like that scene from Willy Wonka when it's yeah. like, <laughs> like it's just his head uh, amongst all of the yeah. wacky so to, shit no. that's yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so to accurately explain it, they're, sh they're shooting the actors pretending to fall down a thing. They're <laughs> waving their arms in the air. As a swirling red thing goes over them. They just superimpose uh, over top of them. It also reminded me briefly of uh, Jackie Gleason's acid trip in Skidoo. Oh, jeez, yeah. <laughs> it was that sort of effect, yeah. So she's taken to this uh, witch's realm, which is depicted as two old people in a chicken coop fighting over a baby that looks like it was made out of chicken. <laughs> it, li it literally felt like I was at, like, fucking Halloween Horror Nights <laughs> at Playland or something mm -hmm. like that, because, yeah, it's like a room separated with, with literal chicken wire, <laughs> and Linda Blair's, like, walking down a hallway, like, what's this? And, yeah, and, like, the two witches are fighting over, like, a, a, a plastic fetus, mm -hmm. and they're, like, holding it up, like, oh, <laughs> look at us, isn't this creepy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they start smashing it into the wall in front of her too, like mashing its face into the chicken wire. Mm -hmm. it, that um, for me was the highlight. And for like you know these other characters who who will soon be sucked to the witch dimension or or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, there's no escape. But Linda Blair gets transported back to the hotel almost immediately. Yeah, the, the lady and doesn't suffer like any well because. The witch needs her her baby. She needs her baby. Yeah. yeah. So the the witch just wanted to kind of fuck with her a little bit. You yeah. Know, like this is this is what's gonna happen to you. Yeah. This is what's gonna happen to your baby. One assumes. Uh, uh, I don't know who these two people are. <laughs> <laughs> we will never explain. Yeah. I saw someone in the credits listed as like Satan or the devil or something, and I, I have was like, a feeling I know who that was. I oh. think I do too, but it was definitely not explicit, and, and definitely I'm like, did not look like a devil. It could have been any of no them. No devil that I've ever seen in in cinema. <laughs> yes, but now we've set up the thing that the witch has the power to transport people... <laughs> it's the multiverse. Yeah. To like, somewhere else! Yeah. This but, movie is a combination of Seven and all of the recent Marvel movies. Into the Seven-verse! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the mother is the next one to get sucked into her own little vortex dimension here when she pokes her head into a, a safe. No, it, it's a safe. It's a safe! But it's really like a dumbwaiter or something? No! It's, it's, like, a, a, it's like a crawl space. It's, it's a safe that where you, when you open it up, it's actually the chimney. Sure. <laughs> so you store your valuables in like this fucking d d dumb waiter or whatever that leads to the fireplace. But the mean mom opens this safe that leads to nowhere mm. uh, and immediately starts getting, I guess, sucked into the witch dimension. Mm -hmm. But this, this is this is just this poor actress. Like, like, she doesn't even have like, uh, the, like, like, like the red effect over her at this point. She's literally just going like, "No, some unseen force is is pulling me," <laughs> and they're trying to get across that like. 
it's like really pulling her in because her oh her nail polish is like streaking onto the well, no it's blood I was, was it, is it the blood I think from it, her I, finger I think oh, it's yeah. meant to be like yeah she's she's grabbing on with her fingers but like the force is so strong it's leaving like bloody fingerprints okay behind I couldn't see how you would think it was nail polish because the effect is not good <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't make any sense uh, given what we're seeing but yeah she gets uh, she she gets I mean. Just have a couple of monster hands, like, reach, yeah. reach off camera and pull her don't, down. Don't force this old woman to crawl into a chimney this way. <laughs> so in her, uh, with her ironic uh, punishment, because she's greedy, she gets punished by having her lips sh- sewn shut, which is a pretty gruesome effect. And, and, very and, well and done. Is and the, yeah. is, is the poster image. Yeah. I feel like that's that was uh, uh, rightfully their their money shot mm. uh, uh, for this. It, uh, it, it is an effect that, even though... You can 100% tell how it was done mm. just by looking at it. You can see like the false the make, mouth yeah, the, the, over the her effect. mouth. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't take away from how effective it is. It's still very creepy. It's still very well done. Yeah. My my only criticism of it is it goes on way too long. Way too long. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. I felt like this oh, movie could have been like 30 minutes for sure. Yeah. <laughs> like the guy, yeah, the guy who's like putting the needle into mm. her lips, like pokes it through. We see like the blood come out of like. Cool. Yeah. He pokes it back up. He goes like, down, oh, like, cool. He pokes it in a third time. And like, okay. Now, now, okay. now it's kind of like going back over yeah. the first string or whatever. So mm. yeah, he's not doing a great job at it. No, but it's it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> it was at that point that I started taking the movie a bit seriously, though, because the, <laughs> the practical effects of this it raised my expectations, which might not have been the best thing. <laughs> this, uh, this was the point in the movie where you said to yourself, "Oh, am I about to watch like a horror movie?" Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, okay kind of was for a few yeah. minutes. It kind of was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, the, the best part of the movie for me is, like, coming up next, where she's actually in the real world trapped in the chimney, and her lips are sewn shut in the real world, but, you know, it's getting cold at night, so they light a fire, and she can't scream for help. And I'm like, this is very clever. Very genuinely well, well done. And it's a, gr- yeah. a, 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 a gruesome, ironic end to, to an unpleasant character who's mm. been nothing but mean and nasty to, yeah, to very, everyone. Very satisfying. In, in, in this none, film, and she just... All her family members are none the wiser that they're burning her alive. Yeah, it's it's very well done. The practical effects for her burning alive are also well done. Mm-hmm. Like the skin melting and stuff. I, I will was say, also... having your mouth sewn shut is one thing. I could definitely muffle a scream loud enough that the mm. people in the next room could probably yeah. guess that I'm in the fireplace. Or at the very least, notice that something is, is, is in the general vicinity of where they're about to start a fire. What's that burning flesh smell? Where's that coming from? Well, yeah. they do they do touch on that, because I was thinking about that, and the guy's like, that is some interesting smelling wood. And that just, <laughs> it smells like burning human flesh. <laughs> David Hasselhoff's soon-to-be ex-wife and the son of the real estate guy mm. uh, find a Matthew little... Broder. Yeah. Matthew Broderick. <laughs> Matthew Broderick. Matthew yeah, Broderick. They, they find another room to bang in, and, you know, everyone else, when they get sucked into like the vortex there's like a bit of build up to it yeah this one is just like nah smash cut to and, them in the vortex and it's together it's twice as funny because there's two of them doing it yeah and it's, <laughs> and so like what could be funnier than this oh two people next to each other going mm. like this and they kind of have different energies yeah <laughs> So their punishment is that she gets strangled, like tied to a chair and strangled. But also, get, but also her hand comes off. Yeah, I thought that was from the rope, like like it was so tight that it was cutting into the ha- into the wrist. Right, right. that's what I got yeah. from that. And his punishment is to get crucified. And it's also confusing because yeah, the, in the witch dimension, she's strangled with a rope. But when she uh, is placed back into uh, the real dimension or whatever, <laughs> she's impaled on a swordfish mounted on a, on on a, on a wall. marlin. She's uh, fishy spike through her neck. Um, That's the right term for it. <laughs> I couldn't fucking think. I don't know a sword, whatever. And but his punishment seems to be the same in both dimensions. Yeah, he gets crucified. He gets crucified the right way up in the ghost dimension. But when he comes back. Uh, he's upside down. Yeah. Well, that was the same thing with the with the mom too. Rose was upside down. Oh, yeah, so maybe when you come out of the wish dimension, mm-hmm. maybe it's the upside down. Maybe this is a Stranger Things. <laughs> How about good. that? Yeah, you're covering all the bases. It would make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This movie predicted everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's ahead of its time. Yeah, a real watershed moment when I this thought, film was made. I was thinking because you know the because the mom was cruel and her mouth getting shown up there uh, sewn up. There was some irony there. And then, like, the lust lady sure. gets penetrated by the phallus sword or whatever. 
Um, and then Buddy just gets crucified because why not? It's cool. And, it is, it, and his his sin was was avarice, right? I think he, he was also lust. Like, I th- or oh, I th- maybe yeah. it was a, it was a lust twofer. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, okay, because cool. like we would like it if this movie was uh, acknowledging the seven deadly sins, but the witch specifies that the three doors to to hell are through greed, lust, and uh, the, the blood, blood of a virgin. Blood of a virgin. And <laughs> there you go. Kind of, uh, kind of off topic there. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. kind of lost the thread here. By the, the third door, we like forgot what we were doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so it's really not one for one. The, the the mean mom is greedy, so her mouth is sewn shut? Yeah. yeah. What does that have know. to do with anything? I just thought because she was That's mean, That's a gluttony too. thing. Yeah. I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, she's always running her mouth, you know, these broads. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I also thought it was weird when uh, Buddy, when Matthew Broderick gets crucified, <laughs> Hey, and set on it's fire. Me, buddy, how's it going? <laughs> She's burning a voodoo doll. I'm like, he's already on fire. Why are you burning the voodoo doll? It seems that's how you set. That's how it works. That's how you get the body on fire because you gotta. But she's a witch. We saw the fire uh, underneath the the cru- crucifixion before we see her like lighting the voodoo doll. Right. On well, fire. they had to set that fire early, Danny, because they were out, they were on like a uh, time, yeah, they were on like time in constraints. Stormy weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, like, the rain's gonna put this out. The we rain that's one, not there. We had one shot where we could get the fire under this crucifixion. I don't I don't care how early we're editing it back into yeah. the movie. Yeah. So yeah. So the people are starting to clue in that uh, there's witchery afoot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that should have been the title. Yeah. Witchery afoot. Yeah. That's what you need. You need one more word in the title. Witchery, yeah. uh, parentheses, afoot. It has to be parentheses. parentheses. That's how you know it's a movie yeah. title. David Hasselhoff's girlfriend confirms that, like, yes, it's a satanic ritual. That's I, going, I wrote that down. Like, Jesus I, Christ, lady. Upside down cross where Jerry was burned. And Linda slash throat. It's all part of an ancient satanic ritual. She said satanic, and then I paused the movie, and then I started writing it down, and then I realized, how how do you write down satanic? How does one... I, I put S-A-T-O... <laughs> oh, like the drink! Oh, that makes more yeah. sense than what I did. Yeah, but she says satanic. Tommy at one point says he has to go to the bathroom. Yes, which I also is the room wrote that down, too. I has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, that's where the marlin was. That's right. <laughs> It's like a, it's like, it would it would make so much sense if it was like a small Italian boy. He speaks like he's like a like like a small Mexican man. I have I have to go to the to the washrooms. It's very strange. This this child's accent. I don't know where yeah. it comes from. Uh, um, but uh, but David Hasselhoff's girlfriend. Maybe he was dubbed by <laughs> sure, yeah. by, small, by Pepe. <laughs> they dubbed they dubbed him uh, the, the Frog. Yes. yes, David Hasselhoff's girlfriend, who's kind of the main character of this movie. Yeah, a little weird uh, yeah. given that it's it's uh, uh, not one of the two bankable names in this movie, mm. and also just just one of the worst actors I've ever seen in my life. Mm. But it's her turn to get taken to yeah. the witchy world. And this is where we meet Satan question mark, who mm. is like a, a, a long, lanky, shirtless man mm. who has like a, like a goopy mouth. Mm. I don't really have any other way to describe it. How would you describe this guy's mouth other than yuck? <sighs> Yeah, it, it's it's bloody. Uh, it's, it's very kind of flappy and it's fleshy, viscous. Uh, yeah, like it look, it's that thing where like where Jonah Hex from Jonah Hex, but, of, yeah, but, but like but the, across the whole mouth. I thought honestly when I first saw him, I thought his mouth had been sewn together as well. Um, just because it it was quite across everything, it's it's kind of like uh, like the predator. It, it could split apart. Um, it was sideways almost. Uh, I don't know. What it reminded me of, like, think about like anthropomorphic cartoon slime. You know, mm. like little gobs of like mm. slime mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Whenever yeah. they open their mouth, there's always like strings the of parts. slime yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. almost yeah. looks like steel bars or yeah. whatever. It's it's kind of giving that a little yeah. bit. I don't know what to make of this character. My, my I thought it looked good. The practical effects, again, it was uh, gross. I, mean, I was grossed out by it. Uh, oh, there's, lot, there's lots to be grossed out with this scene. It's one of the most violent rape scenes I think I've ever seen in a movie. This? This, yeah. Oh, I mean, I've I I watched far far well, you're worse a creep. movies than you. I'm a big, I'm a big creep. That yeah, is but true. I don't know. This scene went on way too long. I actually, yeah. I actually, I thought this movie, uh, uh, this scene was 
filmed in such a way where I, I certainly got the impression that this this character is 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 raping poor Linda Leslie. I forget which yeah. one it is, but I, I I actually didn't think it was as salacious as all that. The way that it's cut together, I wasn't even sure if that's what was happening. Mm. But then we cut to the end of the movie, and I feel like that's oh. that is. Her What's going on? It does really feel like they're trying to do like a Rosemary's Baby type thing where this yeah. woman is impregnated by the devil mm. uh, and that's why she has to be a virgin. So they shoot a flare into into the sky, into the clear night sky. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly and, visible. Yeah, and the only person to see it is the little wheelchair girl. Yeah, who's, thank God for her. Who's up late at night watching like some fucking grindhouse movie. <laughs> like, like some post-apocalyptic shit. <laughs> and you would think as an audience member that... Uh, uh, this is going to mean something to the plot of the movie. Mm. You would be wrong! This goes nowhere! She, she wheels over to her parents' room, wakes up, or no, her dad's like awake in bed smoking, he, smoking in bed. He, he's reading The Godfather <laughs> and smoking a cigarette in bed. And her mother is curled up on her side, probably wondering where she went wrong <laughs> in life. Yeah. I changed my mind. This is my favorite scene from the movie. <laughs> and the dad says, go go back to bed. Stop watching that crap on TV. Yeah, you're, you're too you're obsessed with B movies. <laughs> Go back to it. Even though, even though his daughter literally says, "I saw a flare coming from the eye, the, like the witch island, yeah. which but, everyone knows is like possessed or haunted or whatever." And I get it. The Godfather is a real page turner, but maybe call someone, <laughs> yeah. call the authorities, maybe. Yeah, well, she, um, she does. She does. <laughs> But it, again, but she misses the it's chief. so pointless because she calls the, the, the police sheriff or whoever, and it, it takes the time to show us that she stays on the line for like six or seven rings, mm. and then she hangs up as soon as the sheriff, the old ass sheriff gets in the room. <laughs> she doesn't leave a message or anything. That there's, there's nobody else working at the station at this yeah. hour. The real estate agent, the father of the of the real estate mm. agent, is on like a one man campaign <laughs> to try and get anyone to take him seriously to mm. get him to this island so he can find. There's a really weird scene between him and the sheriff where the sheriff has all of this dialogue and he's saying, "All like, I'm I'm sure your son is fine. He's probably back at the house. Don't worry about it. It's perfectly fine." And then they leave the room. The father doesn't have a single line of dialogue. And I thought that was really weird, <laughs> the way that that scene was yeah. edited, based on uh, what what his wants were in yeah. that scene. Mm. Like, he, he, he should have been more, like, concerned mm. uh, in that moment. So, back at the island, oh, we should we should mention that Tommy had, was gifted, like, a tape recorder. And yes, from Linda Blair. From, she gives him an early birthday present, or just a present or whatever. Yeah, a Sesame um, Street branded tape recorder. I swear to God. I don't think I had this tape recorder growing up, but I definitely knew a kid who had this tape recorder. This growing. specific one? This yeah. brought... Like, a there weird, was nostalgia seeing that tape recorder. This brought sure. like a weird sense memory for me that I couldn't mm. quite place my finger on, but yeah, this looks very... Definitely would have seen something like this at like a consignment shop or something but like it's, that. But yeah. it's, it's a pivotal plot point because it, it leads into uh the climax of the movie mm -hmm. yeah so yeah linda blair has given him yeah just this blank tape on this mm -hmm. uh, uh tape recorder with big bird and oscar on the outside yeah. of it and uh, tommy happens to overhear the witch muttering something in german so he records it which i thought like okay this is going to be like sort of a thing that you play back in or in reverse and that's going to send the witch no, back to hell. german mm -hmm. she wasn't talking backwards she was speaking german no what you do <laughs> you play that do you speak german no, but Nine. I know she was how do you German. how do you know she wasn't speaking backwards, baby? The, no, what I'm saying. <laughs> sorry, what I'm what I'm getting at is you play the tape in reverse, and that's gonna send. Uh, that's the back. Beatles. Jeez. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, you sync it up with the Wizard of Oz or whatever. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, like, he's, like, listening to, like, the witch talk in German. David Hasselhoff says something in a weird Scottish accent to the kid. Uh, Tommy Miller, the woman will drive you around the bend. They'll put the very devil in you. I don't think Hasselhoff is great with kids, and this is this is why. Like, I don't know if he's trying to endear himself to the kid, but he's doing a lot of accent. That's work. clearly what he's doing. He's trying to, yeah. And then and then Tommy opens his mouth, and Hasselhoff realizes what kind of kid he's working with. Here, so <laughs> Immediately walks away. I will say, when you want your Hasselhoff to come off as the best actor in the movie, 
Sur- surround him with this surround cast. Surround him with this cast, which I should point out includes an Academy Award nominee. <laughs> I'm sorry, Linda. This is sort of your episode. You're not great in this movie no. either. You're kind of pretty bad. My God. Honestly. When she, when I she, mean, she's not as bad as most of these other actors, no. but. The one scene where she has a dialogue with the Virgin, I was like, oh my God, poor Linda. So do you believe in paranormal phenomena? Do you study professionally or is it a hobby? You know. Witches, spirit spells, unexplainable events. Well, yeah, I've studied for so many years, I definitely believe in it. Uh, this movie does pass the Bechdel test, though. Yeah. I, I wrote that down. Yeah, they're, they're not talking about a man. Not they're talking about a man, they're talking about, about a witch! witch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so um, the witch gets a hold of the father's embroidered His handkerchief. His embroidered handkerchief. It's a very... It's a very silly moment. It's like you see this the, with his initials FB on it, and I feel like the witch has like this line where she's all like F for fear and B for blood. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all right, we didn't really need to go that far. We but... get it. You're, you're spooky. <laughs> uh, she, she wraps it. She's in... really reaching for like the yeah. the uh, ironic deaths at this point <laughs> because um, she starts stabbing him, and that's the blood. Yeah. At this point in time, we have found the mom in the fireplace. Mm, and yes. it's at this point in time uh, that we realize uh, absolutely no one is is shocked or upset at the death of this woman. <laughs> mm. It's it's predicated by uh, Linda Blair literally saying, where's Rose? And at that point in time, I'm like, isn't that your mom? Yeah. Isn't that literally your mom? <laughs> Why are you calling her that? Yeah. She insists on it. <laughs> and she insi- yeah, exactly, yeah. But she, I, she, hate, I hate being a mother. Yes, <laughs> I hate being called a mother. I hate, I hate being a mother so much, that's why I had two kids, a, a small child, very late in my life. Yeah, like that, that's it. it would, <laughs> Tommy's like what six, and she's this woman's like pushing fifty. You could be missing. <laughs> like I thought maybe they were grandparents, but nope, that's her son. And also at this time, yeah, her husband they they find her body in the uh, the chi- the chimney after he says like that's some weird smelling wood, and then the corpse falls down, and his immediate next line is we're never getting out of here. And my, my reaction to that is all like, that's your wife, man! Mm. Come on! I know, like, things weren't going so well in the marriage, but, like, show, show a little yeah. anything, yeah, really. you know? A surprise! Show anything! <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so she makes that voodoo doll uh, that has, like, a smiley face on it. Hey, <laughs> that was a nice you gotta touch. add a little bit of flair. Yeah, uh, she starts stabbing the voodoo doll and then he just you know, hemorrhages all the blood everywhere. A, ra- a, a pretty cool effect where like his veins are like the veins, pulsating. The popping veins. Yeah. 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 Again, vein practical stuff, effects. Vein were, stuff is creepy so the yeah. idea of just like your veins just like exploding. Yeah, yeah. that's a creepy image. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah. yeah. Um, around- Linda, Linda Blair gets like a, a good face full of her, her dad's blood when, mm. his, when his neck vein just yeah, like good splatters out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. That, no, that was great. You know, around this time, the chief of police and the real estate dad, they, they get a helicopter and because I guess it, the wind has died down. And but just for that one for moment, that, though. one window. Because, yeah, because when they get to the island, as soon as they get to the island, the helicopter pilot's basically like, we really got to take this thing back. This wind is, we, just gotta, we, we can't sit down on the island. Mm. He says, yeah, we can't sit down on the island. So my thought was, like, why did you take the helicopter yeah, just here, to then? check in on him. Yeah, yeah, just to see. I loved how <laughs> the time of day kept changing in yes. every fucking shot of that helicopter scene. Well, sometimes it's day. Sometimes, sometimes it's dusk. Sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's night. Sometimes it's day for night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, completely changes within yeah. uh, with, with, within the same scene yeah. sometimes. Uh, the people can't get out of the house. The witch is using all this power to like lock all the doors and windows so they can't you know wave down the, the helicopter. So the helicopter fucks off. <laughs> I was surprised and quite impressed that this derelict hotel had bulletproof glass windows when they start smashing it with it. I mean, I guess it could be magic. It's but, magic windows. Mm. Yeah, yeah but, I guess. But it just struck me that this how, the house, now I'm saying it, uh, the it's casa. The, the casa. <laughs> <laughs> Italian for hotel. <laughs> you heard it here first. I'm surprised they didn't even just try to find like the heaviest thing in the room and smash a window. Well, Hasselhoff does. He does. He gets he, a chair. He gets a chair. Oh, he does? Okay. I mean, I was just like dead eyed staring at that projector, the movie projector, and just being like, Use that. Yeah, we don't need this Try anymore. Try that, yeah. you know? Throw the kid out the window. Yeah. <laughs> He's pretty happy. Yeah, this scene just goes on for so long. Like, the helicopter circles around. The real estate dad is all like, I guess they're not here. And then, like, for half a second, he's all like, wait, I heard something. And then they go back, and then they leave again. It's just mm. like, God, we gotta... They yeah. really needed to, like, fill up this runtime with yeah. just, like, unnecessary bullshit. Kind of like these podcast episodes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, we're very familiar with that. 
<laughs> um, at one point, Linda Blair becomes possessed by the witch. Yes. Uh, not... Play, playing to her strengths. Yeah, and she's got a <laughs> she's got a funky hairdo because <laughs> that's how you know she's spooky. What happens? Uh, they they manage to get out of the house once the helicopter leaves, so the witch kind of allows them. We to do that. find out that the woman in black wants to. Uh, she's doing some sort of spell that'll make her be reborn again in Linda Blair's baby? Yeah. I think is the idea. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, but again, it's very... Uh, it's very poorly explained, and the people who are explaining it have thick accents, so it's it's kind of, it's yeah. a little tricky to figure out what's going on. They think they see the woman in black at, at, the, at the top floor of the house, like in the attic, so they rush up there. Tommy says, that's not the witch, and uh, they open the door, and oh, it's it's uh, it's creepy uh, Linda Blair. And at that point, uh, it's the ending to Super Metroid, where the house starts collapsing, <laughs> and they, they have to get out of the house. <laughs> Hasselhoff and his girlfriend run down to his little boat, and uh, they th- that's when they remember, oh, right, there's, like, a child. Mm-hmm. There's, like, a defenseless child. Mm-hmm. So we got to run back. We got to get Tommy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they run back into the house. That's that's falling apart or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's an earlier scene where Tommy's playing around with his big bird uh, <laughs> tape recorder thing, and he just awkwardly says, I love you, Jane. I love you, Jane. I love you, <laughs> Jane, over and over again. Yeah. Uh, he says it, like, nine or ten times. Weird thing to record. Weird but- thing to do it. But it turned out he did it for a reason. It was Chekhov's Sesame Street tape recorder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love you, Chief. 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 Yeah, like David Hasselhoff gets stabbed with like a, a fork or something. Yeah, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> or who stabbed him? Slightly there was bigger no than there. a fork. Yeah, looked like a like a devil's pitchfork almost. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, he got stabbed with something. He mm. got stabbed from behind, and he's down for the count. Mm. Leslie, not virgin girlfriend anymore. Uh, she happens to run into the possessed Linda Blair in the hallway. She's got uh, Tommy in her clutches, but then he drops the tape recorder and. You know, it would make way more sense if, like, now it's it's on a loop because it's, like, a busted tape recorder at this point. But no, it just plays the I love you, Jane thing. Yeah, which, he would have had to have rerouned that tape to the very beginning yeah. to get that thing. Because <laughs> they, 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 they recorded the German as they did. well. Exactly. <laughs> that was later, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and Linda Blair has enough of her, her sense uh, to, to, to claw her away from the witch's grasp. Mm. And she recreates the opening and she throws herself uh, through... Mm. Through the window. Does she survive? Unknown! Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's... Uh, actually, I, I actually, I really appreciated that ending because the initial woman, I'm remembering now, she was not a witch. She was potentially going to become a witch and chose to kill herself. I mean, it doesn't make sense with so, the... So it's like a time loop thing? Like a, I, I don't know if they were fully doing a time loop, but it was certainly like a oh, throwback she was to, she was the original Linda Blair. This was this yeah. was the first time that the woman in black tried to do this thing and re reborn herself through another woman's baby. Is that the I, is that the, the track know. that you're on? I just the, the the first scene from what I remember when they're describing the history of this hotel was someone chose to kill themselves by throwing themselves out of a window rather than become a witch, and then Linda Blair ends up doing that exact thing. And I thought, dress dress the same, as dress the, the exact dress same, the exact yeah. same, and she's pregnant in, as well in her yeah. shower curtain or whatever <laughs> outfit that <Yeah>. was. <laughs> um, she's heavily pregnant, you know. So, so sure. you know, everything yeah. looks like a shower curtain at that point in time. Yeah, that's fair. The the leisure wear of, of yes. today has not yet been invented yet. <laughs> um, so Hasselhoff's dead. Linda Blair, quested, possibly dead. Possibly dead. I think we can infer maybe that she is. Yeah. And the then, fate of Tommy is kind of unknown, but I, up in I the assume air. he's fine back he on the mainland. The, the, uh, the his entire his off. entire family is now dead. Yeah. <laughs> including his very his suspiciously old mom. Yeah. And uh, the movie wraps up very fucking quickly with a cut to a hospital the very next day, where uh, Leslie wakes up and the doctor says like, "Well, you should be fine, and so will your baby." And Leslie looks at the camera and says, "My baby." No, no, no. She says. My baby. <laughs> and looks directly at the camera in a very, like, like it was, wah, 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 wah. It was somewhere between the two of those. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, there was definitely a, my baby, kind of like, 
I think that was the intention. Mm. Which, again, it feels like the writers of this forgot what they were trying to do. (laughs) Because Linda Blair had the baby. We just needed the virgin for her blood. Yeah. But at some point in time, she was impregnated by Melty Mouth Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this was the prequel to The Omen. I think that uh, this child is clearly the son of the devil. Uh, and then the, you know, it just seamlessly moves into the omen and, you know, she names the child Damien and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. Right. Uh, in Italy, uh, the omen is known as... <laughs> the cast of... The like, cast of seven. seven. They jumped all the way to 28 <laughs> yeah. for that one. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. It, it really does feel like they tried to do too much with this movie, but they also didn't put enough thought into everything they wanted to do. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's a very short movie and yet it is filled with time wasting. Yeah. <laughs> it's of, like they really got to stretch this this the time limit out. It's barely an hour and a half. Yeah, a lot of spinning its wheels. So yeah, that's witchery. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there anything uh, that happened that uh, we didn't cover that we wanted to uh, bring up? One thing that I noticed in the o- like all the way back in the opening credits is that this movie was produced by Production Group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> Which, all right, that's tracks, but yeah, that is a phony fucking shell company if I ever heard one. So, uh, Witchery, La Casa Quattro, uh, does it have a certain something or just a whole lot of nothing? Danny, you are the guest. What are, what are your thoughts? I thought it, even with the bad acting, if it had better editing, it could have been a decent movie. I think there was a solid foundation. The practical effects were good. The story was generic in the sense of like it's the haunted hotel with mm-hmm. a witch and you know summoning the devil with all these rituals that old chestnut yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so like it would it would never have been like fantastic because it didn't have an original premise but i thought that the the idea of the story of like you know with the uh, attaching it to the seven deadly sins and um, even though it only covered give, like three give of or them. Ta- give or take yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the, <laughs> Uh, rounding down. <laughs> the, seven, the seven deadly sins, give or take five. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, I think that if they had, as we kind of alluded to, like, with the writing, they were trying to do a lot, and some of them, I think, were genuinely good ideas. The practical effects were amazing, like, yeah. surprisingly good for how bad the rest of it was. Yeah. Um, if I can f- forgive bad acting because it can just be funny. Um, but like the, I don't know, a lot of it was just tedious to get through, uh, just because of how long it was. So yeah, like cutting it down to like 30 minutes, um, and maybe adjusting some of the plot points a little bit might've made a good movie Mm -hmm. as it currently is. It was awful. I mean, like nice to see the, the good practical effects was cool. Um, but like, you know, kind of like we were saying with Troll 2, like, you could just see some clips of that, and then you've seen all the good parts of the movie. Um, but yeah, no, th- those are those are my two sides. Yeah, there's gotta be, like, a La Casa supercut on YouTube that's <laughs> just, like, all the mo- That, like, half of it is just Evil Dead 2. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, oh, wow. Yeah. They really drop yeah. drop their production budget for these later movies. You know, like I, I agree totally 100% with what you're saying there, Danny. There's a lot of stuff here in the movie that is very effective, uh, done and done very well. I've seen worse Italian B-movies oh, yeah. than this one. There's like a few technical hiccups on there. The acting is, I think, hilariously bad mm-hmm. uh, in places. I think this would have been a fun thing to watch as a group. But, yeah, like... A lot of the uh, the ideas of those, the sort of the plot centric stuff, it leaves you questioning things a little bit more. Like, why didn't they just do this? Like, or why did they include that if they're not going to follow up on it? So I think that you know kind of breaks down on a narrative level. Uh, but you know, it's shot well enough. The effects are, are good. Some of the, the practical uh, effects are good. The practical. The rest of the effects right, yeah, are the, very yes, bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and don't even make sense. And even the parts that we liked, yeah, I, we kind of all agree that they ran a little too long. I don't know, there's, there's some decent bones to this, but I, I couldn't recommend this in good conscience. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give it a light recommendation. Look, I think if you sign up for a movie that has this sort of pedigree that is like one movie but has been retitled as like a different movie <laughs> uh, and has you act- get what you pay for and has <laughs> actors who clearly aren't speaking their native tongue mm-hmm. and and uh, was seemingly edited by a leaf blower. 
Uh, <laughs> you know, you you get what you signed up for, and yeah. I got what I signed up for. I got uh, some some great a Italian schlock. Yeah. And uh, Which you're big fans of. You can't you can't judge this on the merits of like other horror movies. I you I know, so. you gotta judge it on like the merits of like they what made, it is, they, not what you wanted it to be. They made this for mm. five hundred dollars in a sandwich. <laughs> yes, you right. know, like they just like, shot yes. it over a weekend. Uh, I will say that I did enjoy this movie more than I thought I would. I think it really starts picking up after like the the, the witch kills the boat captain. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's the second movie we've done in a row with a salty sea dog. I, so there even we though go. This, this one had no lines. No, he had no dialogue. Yeah. Uh, probably for the best. All right, uh, that was witchery. That was witchery. That was some some witchery was afoot, and <laughs> we got we got underneath it. Mm. Danny, thanks so much for being thanks here. Thanks for coming back. Yep. Thanks, thanks for having me. Mm. I don't know. It was, it was third time the charm. I feel charmed, in, in, especially <laughs> in terms of the fact that we're talking about witchcraft. Well, okay, a charm. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Thank you, Kaz. Well, and we're ch- when you know what? Now that you're, here, I can make bad puns too. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you're what we a good want. company. That's what we want. <laughs> Uh, and your charming presence has charmed us, mm. is what I will say. Wonderful. Enchanted us. Enchanted us, indeed. Um, Bewitched you? It, I wouldn't go that of, far. Uh, <laughs> all, all of the above. Witchery. All right. Uh, directed by Fabrizio something or other. Sure. My book's all the way over here. I'm not even going to look Pagliacci. it up. Pagliacci. Pa- Yay! <laughs> um, if you like this episode, please check out our back catalog. We have a bunch of episodes recorded under The Fuck Is This. It's basically the exact same show. You can follow us on all of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, X. That's the same thing. Instagram. Uh, we'd like to thank Eddie Lamb for his fantastic theme music. You can follow me on Letterboxd. I'm Kaz Lesgard. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. My name's Jameson Rafter. I have uh, some YouTube uh, cartoons that you can find on Uptown Slim Jim. I'll leave you all with this uh, movie quote that uh, Linda Blair said in uh, one of her famous roles. Your mother sucks cocks in hell. I would, I, I would have assumed. Yeah. I, I had to assume that that, that, would, that, would, have, that, would, that would have been well, the Well, name one. another iconic movie line that Linda Blair says. Here, I got this. I got that you press record mm. and then Big Bird yeah. says... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>